From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special Cube interview. We are here at the Cube Virtual covering AWS Summit Virtual Online. This is Amazon's summits that they normally do all around the world. They're doing them now virtually. We are here in the Palo Alto COVID-19 quarantine crew, getting all the interviews here with a special guest, Vice President of Machine Learning. We have Swami Cube alumni who's been involved in not only the machine learning, but all of the major activity around AWS, around how machine learning's evolved and all the services around machine learning workflows from transcribe, recognition, you name it. Swami, you've been at the, at the helm for many years and we've also chatted about that before. Welcome to the virtual cube covering AWS Summit. Hey, pleasure to be here, Tom. Uh, Great to see you. I know um, times are tough. Everything okay at Amazon? You guys are certainly cloud scale, not, not too unfamiliar of working remotely. You guys do a lot of travel, but what's it like now for you guys right now? Hey, um, they're all actually uh, doing well. We have been, uh, I mean, um, this, uh, many of we are working hard to make sure we continue to serve our customers, uh, even from the side, we have done a so we are taking measures to prepare and we are confident that we'll be able to meet customer demands for our capacity uh, during this time. So we are also helping customers to adapt quickly and nimbly current challenges. We have various examples of amazing startups working in this area to reorganize themselves to serve customer. We can talk about that one more later. Well, large scale, you guys have done a great job and it's been fun uh, watching and chronicling the journal, journey of AWS as it now goes to a whole nother level with the post pandemic, we're expecting even more surge in everything from VPNs, workspaces, you name it, all these workloads are going to be under a lot of pressure to do more and more value. You've been at the heart of one of the key areas, which is the tooling and the scale around machine learning workflows. And this is where customers are really trying to figure out what are the adequate tools? How do my teams effectively deploy machine learning? Because now more than ever, the data is going to start flowing in as virtualization, if you will, of life uh, is happening. Um, we're going to be in a hybrid world with life. We're going to be online most of the time. And I think COVID-19 has proven that this new trajectory of virtualization, virtual work, applications are going to have to flex and adjust and scale and be reinvented. This is a key thing. What's going on with machine learning? What's new? Tell us, what are you guys doing right now? Yeah, uh, as you uh, know, uh, in AWS, we offer uh, the broadest set of learning capabilities, all the way from like uh, expert practitioners, we offer our frameworks and infrastructure layer uh, um, uh, support for all popular frameworks from like TensorFlow, Apache, and, and um, uh, PyTorch on CPUs, GPUs, our own custom chips like Inferentia. And then uh, uh, for uh, aspiring ML developers who want to build their own custom machine learning models, we are actually building, uh, we offer SageMaker, which is our end-to-end -end machine learning service that makes it easy for customers to be able to build, train, tune, and deploy machine learning models. And uh, uh, it is one of our fastest growing machine learning services and many startups and enterprises are starting to standardize their machine learning building on it. And then the final tier is uh, uh, geared towards actually uh, application developers who uh, do not want to go into model building, just want an easy API to build uh, capable such as transcribe, run play recognition and so forth. And I wanted to talk about one of the new capabilities we are about to launch uh, pretty soon called Tetra. Uh, and, and so that's uh, the G, so just from a new standpoint, that's GA now, that's being announced at the summit. That was a yeah. big hit at, at reInvent, Kendra. Yeah. A lot of buzz. It's available. Yeah. So I'm excited to say that uh, Kendra is our uh, new uh, machine learning powered, uh, highly accurate uh, enterprise search service uh, that is generally available. And uh, if you look at what Kendra is, we have actually reimagined the traditional enterprise search service, which has historically been an underserved market segment, so to speak. If you look at it on the public uh, search, on the web search front, it is uh, relatively well-served uh, 
uh, area, whereas uh, the uh, enterprise search has been an uh, area where uh, within an enterprise there is a huge amount of data silos spread that is uh, spread in between in uh, file systems, SharePoint, uh, Salesforce, or uh, uh, various other areas, and uh, deploying a traditional search index is always So even simple questions like, uh, hey, when does an ID desk open, or when, uh, what is the paternity policy, or so forth, uh, these kind of things have been historically super hard to find within an enterprise, let alone if uh, I'm actually in a uh, material science company uh, so for like what 3M was trying to do, enable collaboration of researchers spread across the world uh, uh, to search their experiment archives and so forth. It has been super hard for them to be able to do things. And uh, this is one of those areas where Kendra has enabled the new, of course, where Kendra uh, is a deep learning powered uh, search service for enterprises, which breaks down data silos and collects actually data across various things all the way from like on S3 or file system or SharePoint and uh, various other data sources and uses state-of-the-art NLP techniques to be able to actually index them and then you can query using natural language uh, queries such as like when does uh, my IT desk open and the answer it won't it just give you a bunch of random like so it will tell you it opens at 8.30 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. Or uh, what is the credit card uh, re um, cashback returns for my corporate credit card? It won't give you like a long uh, list of links related to it. Instead, it will give you answer to be 2%. So it's uh, that much highly accurate. Um, you know, people, we, people who have been in the enterprise search or data business know how hard this is. And you know, it is super, it's been a super hard, hard problem the old in the old garden models because databases were limiting to, you know, schemas and whatnot. Now you have a, a data driven world and this becomes interesting. I think the big takeaway I took away from Kendra was not only the new kind of discovery navigation that's possible in terms of low latency, getting relevant content, but it's really the under the covers impact. And I think I'd like to get your perspective on this because this has been an active conversation inside the community uh, in cloud scale, which is data silos, have been a problem. People have had built these data silos and they really talk about breaking them down, but it's real, again, hard. There's legacy problems and all applications that are tied to them. How do I break my silos down or how do I leverage either silos? So I think you guys really solve a problem here around data silos and scale. So yeah. talk about the data silos and then I'm going to follow up and, and get your take on the kind of size of, of data. Megabytes, petabytes, I mean, Talk about data silos and the scale behind it. Really. So if you look at actually uh, how to set up something like a Kendra search cluster, uh, even as simple as from your management uh, console in AWS, you'll be able to point uh, Kendra to various uh, uh, data sources such as Amazon S3 or uh, SharePoint and uh, Salesforce and various others. and. Uh, Say these are the kind of data I want to index. And Kendra automatically pulls in this data, indexes using its uh, deep learning and NLP models, and uh, then automatically builds a corpus. Then I, as a uh, user of the search index, uh, can actually start querying it using natural language and don't have to worry where it comes from. And Kendra takes care of things like access control, and it uses finely tuned machine learning algorithms under the hood to understand the context of natural language query and return the most relevant. I'll give a real world uh, example of some of the few customers who are using Kendra. For instance, uh, if you take a look at 3M, 3M is using Kendra to support, it, uh, support its material science r and by enabling natural language search of their expansive repositories of past research documents that may be relevant to new project. Imagine what this does to a uh, company like 3M Instead of uh, researchers who are spread around the world, repeating the same experiments on material research over and over again, now their engineers and researchers will have the ability to quickly search through the documents. And they can innovate faster instead of trying to literally reinvent the wheel all the time. So it is better acceleration to the market. Even we are in this situation, one of the interesting work that you might be interested in is uh, the Semantic Scholar team at Allen Institute for AI recently opened up uh, what is uh, 
a repository of scientific research called COVID-19 Open Research Dataset. These are expert research articles in that healthcare domain. And now they indexed it using Kendra and it helps scientists, academics, and technologists to quickly find information in a sea of scientific literature. So you can even ask questions like, uh, hey, how different is convalescent plasma uh, treatment compared to a vaccine? And uh, various in-depth questions and Kendra automatically understand the context and gives the summary answer to these questions uh, for the customers. So, uh, and uh, this is one of the things where when you talk about breaking the data silos, uh, it takes care of uh, getting back the data and uh, putting it in a central location, understanding the context behind each of these documents, and then being able to also then quickly answer the uh, queries of customers uh, using simple, plain, natural language as well. So, so what's the scale? Is, uh, Talk about the scale behind this. What's the scale numbers? What are you guys seeing? Obviously you guys always do a good job of having a great announcement and then following up with general availability, which means I know you've got some customers using it. What are we talking about in terms of scales? Um, petabytes, can you give some insight into the kind of data scale you're talking about here? So the, uh, the nice thing about Kendra is uh, it is uh, easily linearly scalable. So I, as a developer, I can keep adding more and more uh, data uh, and there's, uh, uh, it linearly scales to whatever uh, scale our customers want. So, and uh, that is one of the underpinnings of uh, Kendra search engine. So this is where even if you see like uh, customers like uh, price order uh, scoopers is using Kendra to power its uh, regulator application to help customers search through regulatory quickly and easily. So instead of sifting through hundreds of pages of documents, uh, uh, manually to answer certain questions. Now Kendra allows them to answer natural language questions. I'll give another example, which is uh, speaks to the scale one is Baker Tilly, uh, a leading advisory tax and assurance firm is using Kendra to uh, index documents. Compared to a traditional uh, SharePoint based uh, full text search, uh, now they are using Kendra to quickly search product manuals and so forth. And they are able to get answers up to 10x faster. Look at uh, that kind of impact what uh, Kendra has. Uh, being able to index a vast amount of data with, uh, in a linearly scalable fashion, keep adding it uh, the order of uh, uh, terabytes and keep going and uh, being able to search 10x faster than traditional uh, um, I mean, uh, traditional keyword uh, search based uh, algorithm is actually a big deal for these customers. So the, they're very excited. So what is the main problem that you're solving, Kendra? What's the use case? If I'm the customer, um, what's my problem that you're solving? Is it just response to you know, data, whether it's a call center or support, or is it an app? I mean, what's the main focus that you guys came out? What was the vector of problem that you're solving here? So when we uh, talked to customers before we uh, started building Kendra, one of the things that constantly came back uh, for us was uh, that uh, they wanted the same ease of use and the ability to search the World Wide Web. It, customers like those tools within an enterprise. It can be in the form of like an internal search to search within like the HR documents or internal wiki pages and so forth or it can be to search uh, like internal technical documentation uh, or uh, uh, the public documentation to help the contact centers, or is it uh, external search in terms of customer support and so forth, or to enable collaboration by uh, sharing knowledge base and so forth. So each of these really dissected, why is this a problem? Why is it, uh, not being solved by traditional uh, search techniques. One of the things that uh, became uh, obvious was that uh, yeah, unlike the external world where the web pages are linked uh, easily with very well-defined structure, internal world is very messy within an enterprise. The documents are put in a SharePoint or in a file system or in a storage service like S3 or on actually Salesforce or Box or various other things and what uh, really uh, customers wanted was a system which knows how to actually pull the data from various this uh, these data silos 
still understand the access control behind this and enforce them in the search and then understand the real data behind it uh, and not just do simple keyword search so that you can build remarkable uh, search uh, service that uh, really answers queries in a natural language. And this has been the key uh, premise of Kendra and this is what is starting to resonate yeah. uh, with our customers. Uh, I talked with some of the other examples, even in areas uh, like contact centers, uh, for instance, Magdalene Health is using Kendra for its contact centers. So they are able to seamlessly tie like member, provider, or client-specific information with abundance of information about healthcare to its agents so that they can quickly resolve the call. Or it can be on uh, internally to do things like external search as well. So very so you guys, So you guys took the basic concept of discovery and navigation, which is the consumer web, find what you're looking for as fast as possible, but also took advantage of building intelligence around understanding all the nuances and configuration, schemas, access under the covers and allowing things to be discovered in a new way. So you basically make data be discoverable and then provide an interface yeah. for discovery and navigation. Uh, so it's a broad use case that, then. Yeah, that's a, uh, that sounds about right, except we did uh, one thing more. We actually understood uh, not just, uh, we didn't just do discovery and uh, also uh, made it easy for people to find the information. But uh, when we are sitting through like terabytes or uh, hundreds of terabytes of internal documentation, sometimes uh, one of the things that happens is uh, throwing a bunch of uh, hundreds of uh, links to these documents is not good enough. For instance, if I'm actually trying to find out, for instance, uh, what is the ALS marker uh, in a uh, healthcare setting and uh, for a particular, uh, uh, research project, then I don't want to actually sift through like uh, thousands of links. Instead, I want to be able to correctly pinpoint which document contains answer to it. So that is the final element, which is to really understand uh, the context behind each and every document using our natural language processing techniques so that you not only find, uh, discover the information uh, that is relevant, but you also get like highly accurate, uh, possible, precise answers to some of your questions. Well, that's great stuff. Big fan, I was uh, really liking the announcement of Kendra. Congratulations on the GA of that. We'll make some room on our CUBE virtual site for your team to put more Kendra information up. I think it's fascinating. I think that's going to be the beginning of how the world changes with this, this certainly with voice activation and API based applications integrating this in. I just see a ton of activity that this is going to have a lot of headroom. So appreciate that. The other thing I want to get to while I have you here is the news around the uh, augmented artificial intelligence has been um, yeah. uh, brought out as well. So the uh, GA of that is out. You guys are GAing everything, which is right on track with your cadence of AWS law, as I say. Um, what is this about? Give us the head, headline story. What's the main thing to pay attention to of the GA? What have you learned? What's the learning curve? What's the results? So, uh, augmented artificial intelligence service, uh, I call it A2I, but Amazon A2I or uh, service, we made it generally available. And it, it is a very unique service uh, that uh, makes it easy for uh, developers to augment human intelligence with machine learning predictions. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, historically has been a very challenging problem. We look at, uh, so let me take a step back and explain uh, the general idea behind it. We look at uh, any developer building a machine learning application. There are uh, use cases where uh, even actually a 99% accuracy in machine learning is not going to be uh, good enough uh, to directly use that result as the response to uh, you know, back to the customer. Instead, you want to be able to augment that with human intelligence to make sure, hey, if my machine learning model is returning, uh, uh, saying, hey, my confidence interval for this prediction is less than 70%, uh, I would like it to be augmented with human intelligence, then uh, it, A2I makes it super easy for customers to be developers to uh, use actually a human reviewer workflow that comes in built in. 
So then I can actually send it uh, either to the public uh, uh, pool using mechanical Turk, where we have more than 500,000 uh, Turkers, or I can use a private workforce or vendor workforce. So we have. Uh, so now uh, A2I seamlessly integrates with uh, text track recognition or uh, SageMaker custom models. So now, uh, for instance, uh, NHS uh, is uh, integrated uh, A2I with uh, text track so that when they are building these document processing uh, workflows, the areas where the machine learning model confidence score is uh, not uh, as high, they will be able to augment that with uh, uh, their human reviewer workforce so that they can actually build a highly accurate document processing workflow as well. So, so this we think is a powerful capability. So this really kind of gets to what I've been um, feeling in, in, in some of the stuff we've worked with you guys on, on our machine learning piece. It's hard for companies to hire machine learning people. This has been a real challenge. So I like this idea of human augmentation because humans and machines have to have that relationship. And if you build good abstraction layers and you abstract away the complexity, which is what you guys do, and that's the vision of cloud, then you're going to need to have that relationship solidified. So at what point do you think we're going to be ready for um, the cube team or any customer <laughs> that doesn't have to, can't find a machine learning person or may not want to pay the wages that's required. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to find a machine learning engineer. And when does the data science piece come in with visualization, the spectrum of you know pure computer science, math, machine learning guru to full end user productivity of machine learning is where you guys are doing a lot of work. Can you just share your opinion on the, that evolution and where we are on that? Because people want to get to the point where they don't have to hire machine learning folks. Yeah. And have uh, that kind of so if you, look at, uh, if you look at the history of technology, um, I actually always believe that uh, many of these uh, highly disruptive technologies start out as uh, a way uh, that it is available only to experts, and then they quickly go through cycles where it becomes almost commonplace. I'll give an example with uh, something totally outside the uh, IT space. Uh, let's take photography. Uh, I think more than uh, probably 150 years ago, the first uh, professional camera was invented, and uh, it took like three to four years to actually take a really good picture. And uh, there were only very few expert photographers in the world. and uh, then uh, faster to time where we are now. Uh, now even my five-year-old daughter takes actually very good portraits. Uh, uh, I'd actually uh, gives it as a gift to her mom for Mother's Day. So now uh, if you look at Instagram, everyone is a professional photographer. <laughs> I kind of think the same thing is about to, it will happen in machine learning too. Compared to 2012 where there were very few deep learning experts who can really build these amazing applications. Now you're starting to see like tens of thousands of financial customers using machine learning in production in uh, AWS. Not just proof of concepts, but in production. Uh, and, uh, and this number is rapidly growing. I'll give one example. Internally, if you see uh, Amazon uh, to aid our entire company to uh, transform and make machine learning its natural part of the business. Six years ago, we started a machine learning university. And uh, since then, we have been training uh, all our, uh, our engineers to uh, take machine learning courses in this ML university. And uh, a year ago, we actually made these coursework available through our training and certification platform in AWS. And within 48 hours, more than 100,000 people registered. Think about it, that's like a big uh, all-time record. That's why I, I always like to believe that developers have always uh, eager to learn, they are very hungry to pick up new technology. And I wouldn't be surprised if four or uh, five years from now, machine learning is kind of becomes a normal feature of the app, the same way databases are, and it uh, becomes less special. If that day happens, then I would see it as my job is done, so. Well, you got a lot more work to do because I know from the conversations I've been having around this COVID-19 pandemic is, is that the general consensus and validation that the future got pulled forward. And what used to be an inside industry conversation that we used to have around machine learning and some of the visions that you're talking about has been accelerated on the pace of the new cloud scale. But now that people now recognize that virtual and experiencing it firsthand globally, everyone, they're now going to be an acceleration of 
of applications. So we believe there's going to be a Cambrian explosion of new applications that got to reimagine and reinvent some of the plumbing or abstractions in cloud to sure. deliver new experiences because the expectations have changed. And I think one of the things we're seeing is that machine learning combined with cloud scale will create a whole new trajectory of a Cambrian explosion of applications. So this has kind of been validated. What's your reaction to that? I mean, do you see something similar? What are some of the things that you're seeing as we come into this world, this virtualization of our lives? It's every vertical, it's not one vertical anymore that's maybe moving faster. I think everyone sees the impact, they see where the gaps are, and there's new reality here. What's your thoughts? Yeah, if you see the history of um, machine learning, specifically around deep learning, uh, well, the technology is really not new per se, because uh, the early deep learning paper was probably written like close to 30 years ago. Uh, and uh, why didn't we see deep learning take off sooner? It is because historically deep learning technologies have been uh, hungry for compute resources and hungry for like huge amount of data. And then the abstractions were not easy enough. Uh, as you rightfully pointed out, the cloud has uh, come in and made it super easy to get like access to huge amount of compute and uh, huge amount of data, and you can literally uh, pay uh, by the hour or by the minute. And uh, and with new tools uh, being made available to developers like SageMaker and all the AI services we are talking about, now there is an explosion of uh, options available that are easy to use for developers that we are starting to see almost like a huge amount of uh, like innovation starting to pop up. And um, unlike traditional disruptive technologies, which you usually see traction in like one or two industry segments and then it crosses the custom and then goes mainstream, with machine learning, uh, we are starting to see traction almost in like every industry segment all the way from like in financial sector, uh, uh, where fintech companies like Intuit is using it to uh, forecast its call center volume and then personalization. In the uh, healthcare sector, uh, companies like AI Doc is uh, using uh, computer vision to assess radiologists. And then we are seeing in uh, areas like public sector, NASA is uh, partnered with AWS to use machine learning to do anomaly detection uh, algorithms to detect uh, solar flares in the space. Uh, and uh, the examples are uh, plenty. It is because now machine learning has become such commonplace that almost every industry segment and every CIO is actually already uh, looking at uh, how can they reimagine and reinvent and make their customer experience better powered by machine learning. In the same way, Amazon actually asked itself uh, like eight or 10 years ago. So very excited. Well, you know, you guys continue to do the work and I agree, it's not just machine learning by itself, it's the integration and the perfect storm of elements that have come together at this time, although pretty disastrous, but I think ultimately it's going to come out, of, we're going to come out of this on a new, whole nother trajectory. Uh, it's going to be um, a creativity will be emerged. You're going to start seeing really those builders thinking, okay, hey, I got to get out there. I can deliver, solve the gaps we are exposed, solve the problems, pre create new expectations new experience. I think it's going to be great for software developers. I think it's going to change the computer science field. And it's really bringing the lifestyle aspect of things. Applications have to have a recognition of this convergence, this virtualization of life. The applications yeah. are going to have to have that. So remember, virtualization helped Amazon form uh, the cloud. Maybe we'll get some new kinds of virtualization. Swami. <laughs> thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Always great to see you. Um, thanks for taking the time. Great to see you, Jonah. So thank you. Thanks we're, again. Here's Swami, right. the Vice President of Machine Learning at AWS, been on before, the CUBE alumni, really sharing his insights around what we see around this virtualization, this online event, obviously Amazon Summit, we're covering with the virtual CUBE, but as we go forward, more important than ever, the data is going to be important, searching it, finding it, and more importantly, having the humans use it, building an application. So the CUBE coverage continues for AWS Summit virtual online. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.